So my name is Maria Meyer. I'm the executive director of Your Women's Fund. As somebody said yesterday, we're a community-based organization. Do you know who the bosses are? The community, right? And as we continue to try and articulate what we do, we say we put a gender lens on everything because if you don't put a lens in and you really look at things, you're going to miss details. And you've got some incredible focusers here today who are going to help you focus on freedom from violence in our community. As we continue to try and say what we do, we're envisioning with many of you here, a post silo community, a Miami-Dade where we honestly recognize that nobody does anything alone. We work together, meshing gears to improve the lives of our entire community. Uh, we focus on women and girls and that we know that benefits everyone. Okay, so I thank the incredible team behind this, our powerhouse board who are present in everything we do. They all break a sweat. I'm sure many of you are there today. And uh, thank you always for all that you do. Um, Vivi, as we continue on with the slides here, I'm gonna go really quickly. We only have an hour of some of the most innovative, creative minds who are focusing on, on looking at exploitation and what we can do about it. So I'm gonna thank One Billion Rising who powers this impact collaborative and brought us initially to uh, the Women's Fund to work together on this Freedom from Justice uh, from Violence Coalition. I will thank all of the incredible speakers who are here today next to us. And I'll say Women's Fund has four pillars, freedom from violence, leadership, health and well-being, and economic mobility. We also have four programs. One of them is this convening that we have today. Another one we're really famous for, public awareness campaigns and famous with you all because many of you participated in getting the messaging right from survivor leaders and community activists for the official stop sex trafficking campaign of the Miami Super Bowl host committee. We also do, hey daddy, why are you still paying women less campaigns for equal pay? We also work on suicide prevention with NAMI and, and others. That's our second program. Grant program. That's what the Women's Fund did originally, and many of you know us for that, but there's a fourth program that not all of you know about. We have decided to support the visibility of women and girls in our community with facts, data, and research. So we've created a gender equity dashboard. You might've seen it on the front page of the Miami Herald, because facts together with the human stories that all of you represent and come here to hear together make for policy change. We uh, are going to ask my senior uh, associate here in research, Viviana Alvarado Pacheco, to share with you this slide, what we are seeing today, and all of this can be found on our website, our gender equity dashboard. Viviana. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. So as you can see on the slide, this is a snapshot of our gender equity dashboard, a section on human trafficking. Um, at the top section, you will see some of the facts that what you should know including that human trafficking reports involving minors have more than doubled over the last decade. And we've also included some great information provided by the Miami-Dade uh, Miami State Attorney's Office. Uh, so shout out to them, they've been amazing. Um, we are hoping to improve all of this data as we go along and we get more information, but it is available right now for, for you to look at. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Viviana, and thank you for all of you in the audience. Seema Campbell, all of these people working in our community today are in your virtual audience. Thank you all for being here. So on we go to the most important thing. We have a very special program. If you haven't all realized, uh, it's different. This is a hybrid event. Uh, Post-COVID, we have been virtual, and it's great to be together with some amazing human beings who are right in front of us and a powerhouse of policymakers and representatives who are gathering today with our hosts and partners, uh, Citrus, uh, creating this joining together force mm -hmm. in a post-siloed Miami <laughs> day. And the program itself and the format is a little bit different today. Uh, many of you know Dr. Brooke Bella, who's partnered with us many times, she's been a speaker many times, uh, participating in many ways, and as a community leader, she's got a special voice um, who's going to give us some real insight on on different aspects that we don't always talk about during uh, national human trafficking awareness month 
So she's helped us with the programming and everything. You'll hear a lot more from Dr. Bellow shortly. But the format, we're going to start um, with a welcome from our, our, our a community leader in human trafficking and citrus health, Dr. Kimberly McGrath. Thank you, Myra. Hi, everyone. So one of the things I love about the Impact Collaborative is it's, it's a conversation. It's um, and I am going to deviate a little bit because I am going to look at some notes. And the reason I'm going to do that is when I talk to a number of folks in our community about what is restorative justice, right? And today's Impact Collaborative, it's restoring restorative justice. And it was amazing to hear the differences in the perceptions of what restorative justice actually is. And I want to make sure that today I'm accurately portraying kind of what our system of care, what we think in Miami-Dade, when we say restorative justice, when referring to human trafficking, what we mean. Um, so to start with, just kind of an overview is restorative justice is really an empathic and comprehensive approach to addressing criminal behavior and when it's compared with a traditional justice model. Um, it examines the harmful impact of the crime or the wrongdoing, whatever it may be, um, and what can be done to repair or minimize the impact of that harm, both on the victim and also on the community. And that's a really important piece, right? The community involvement. Restorative justice is really a cooperative model. Um, when we're talking about human trafficking, we really need to make sure that we have folks from the government, our representatives from uh, law enforcement, legal representatives, that we're all working together. Um, the whole process is to achieve offender accountability, right? Um, reparation to the victim, um, and to make sure that participation, participation is by everyone, all parties that are included in this crime. So it's a extremely collaborative. I'm just gonna keep saying that word today, collaborative. Um, human trafficking viewed through a restorative justice lens really shifts the focus from the criminal act, right, or that wrongdoing, the violation of law, to a viewpoint that this is a violation of people, relationships, and the community, right? It harms all of us. And it seeks to repair that harm. Um, three key pin principles work together. This is interesting. I have two audiences here. <laughs> um, three key principles work together to repair harm to the victim, to address that root cause of that behavior. And you'll hear a lot of that today from Dr. Bello addressing that root cause. Um, and ideally reduce or prevent future harm to others and to the community as a whole. Um, there's models of restorative justice maintain that justice outcomes may not always serve the interests of survivors, offenders, and the community. Sometimes it's appropriate, but not always. And it repairs harm, again, by bringing that community together. So a 2018 study by Urban Institute, I think we're all very familiar with Urban Institute research, um, they interviewed 80 labor and sex trafficking survivors across the nation and 100 social service and criminal justice stakeholders in order to understand their perception of justice in human trafficking cases. What they found is that for most human trafficking survivors, justice is more about healing and preventing future trafficking than it is consequences or punishments for offenders. Um, that survivors are really focused on receiving assistance and achieving independence in receiving resources that help them achieve those self-defined goals that they establish. And most trafficking survivors favor prevention and healing victim over incarceration. Um, pretty, pretty consistent theme. Although survivors agreed on the importance of holding traffickers accountable, that was across the board, there, there needs to be accountability. Um, it's just justice is primarily saw as stopping traffickers from harming, harming others in the future. So that is really today what we're talking about restorative justice that we're, we're really focused on. I think here in Miami-Dade County, restorative justice is embedded and in, incorporated into the values and approach that our stakeholders are using to address human trafficking. Um, our providers and criminal justice stakeholders have really embraced this concept. Um, and they understand that it can help survivors achieve justice from their victimization experiences by incorporating alternative forms of justice and not just traditional forms. 
Um, so for example, our state attorney's office, Catherine Fernandez Rundle has started an innovative trauma-informed law enforcement model for the investigation and prosecution of human trafficking. We're fortunate today in our breakfast uh, that we'll be hosting shortly to have Brenda Mezik, uh, who is the director of that unit speaking. This unit has highly trained in, distinguished prosecutors, investigators, and special victims assistants assigned. And the HT unit really focuses on a dual track. It helps heal victims while at the same time stopping future incidents of trafficking in our community in the future. Um, the Restorative Justice and Demand Education Program by Dr. Brooke Bellow that you're gonna hear today, known in Miami as um, Demanding More with RJED, more commonly known. Um, you'll hear today as she goes into great detail about this anti-sexual violence training program that seeks to empower men to better understand sexual violence and to consider the role of men as fathers. Such an important concept. Um, and I wanna say that before she leaves that she actually encouraged me to bring it to Miami and make the connection so that mm -hmm. I could actually get it done. And that's what kind of leader that Dr. McGrath is. So I wanna publicly <laughs> record it. Thank you, because if it weren't for you, it wouldn't be in Miami. Well, if it wasn't incredible work, so, we wouldn't have asked you. you to come. <laughs> it's amazing, amazing work. Um, and our system per service partners, we have so many folks here today. Please, there's vendor booths outside. Make sure you visit them. But Christy House, the Thrive Program, um, I, there's just Survivor Pathway. There's so many programs, I can't even mention them all. But these programs are trauma-informed. Um, they address trauma associated with trafficking and trafficking experiences, and they help our survivors to achieve autonomy um, and empowerment. And they help them reach those self-defined goals that you heard that backed by research, Urban Institute has shown, this is what our survivors want. They wanna reach these goals. Um, that goal of empowering and, and supporting and lifting up our survivors can't be achieved without our community support and our community advocates. Um, Juliana Fox, Juliana Fantacci, Julia, yeah. Julia. okay. Um, she's an amazing uh, attorney, um, amazing community advocate and fights for the rights of, of the less fortunate. And you're gonna hear from her as well today. Um, it, organizations such as the Women's Fund, we all know Myra, she talked about her four pillars and they just align perfectly and breaking down those silos. It, it's a perfect match for our concepts of restorative justice. It's through the support of the Women's Fund and other programs like the Women's Fund that our survivors are able to achieve those necessary resources to gain independence and meet those goals. So I am very excited about today. Thank you, Myra, for asking me we, to be a part of it. No, we thank you. Partners, um, stronger yes, together, absolutely. we always say. So you're going to go um, welcome some of you? I am going to go welcome, and I am, but I am going to be listening in, and I'll be popping in and out. So thank you, ladies. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, this is family, as you know. Would you like to stay sitting here? Should we just remove these chairs or do you want to sit in chairs, ladies? Up to you. I mean, I'm, I'm okay to stay here. Up to you. All right. <laughs> Terrific. So team, we've got more humans uh, sitting here so we can we could use those chairs in the back. So please take them away. So this Impact Collaborative is a little bit different, but one thing remains the same. This is your Impact Collaborative. Please say hello in the chat. Share your, your ideas. Please do the polls. Please, we want to hear from you. Uh, you all know that. Let's keep it up. So very excited to remind all of us that what we do in the Women's Fund is not try and reinvent the wheel. There are brilliant leaders sitting right here in front of me and on the other side of this wall and in that audience who work with human trafficking and are visionaries. There are wonderful conferences. There's wonderful information online. If you look at more to life. There's so much information that you can go and find. What we're trying to do is bring something a little bit new to the conversation. What can the Women's Fund add by bringing each other together? So we're looking at special voices who can tell us what we need to know and then what we can do to support their leadership and their work. We have the pleasure of having with us a Julia Fantazzi, who is um, doing some work because she sees what many people didn't see. And I've been fascinated over, over the months that in the years that we've known each other to understand why she is 
why she has specialized in the niche that she's doing. So as a two to our form, I'm going to ask Julia first. Julia, if you can introduce yourself a little bit to our audience, both live and virtual, uh, to, to tell them who you are and, and what you do in context of why you're here today. Absolutely. And thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, I am an immigration attorney, but the way that I work and the way the work that I do is very different because there's an aspect of human trafficking that is really not talked enough and is human trafficking with undocumented victims, with undocumented, with undocumented communities. And so what I specialize in and what is my mission is to really fight to help victims of human trafficking gain legal status in the United States because of what happened to them. And so most of, most of our clients don't even know that they can qualify to gain legal status to you know, get their papers based on their experiences. And in this, for immigration purposes, human trafficking is a little bit different because it's not just about you know, the sex trafficking, but it's also about labor trafficking, that it could be seen as labor exploitation. It can also be seen as intimate relationship type of um, exploitation with you know, involuntary servitude and so forth. And also when people come across the border, something is human smuggling and something is human trafficking. When smuggling becomes trafficking, that is when things change. And a lot of people are unfortunately victims of that and they don't even know. They think that it's normal. Everybody happens, everybody happens. And so it is what it is, but that's not true. That's not real. And because of their experience, their situation, they can gain legal status. Um, my real passion is to share and bring awareness to other communities because people don't know what's going on. And you know, our clients don't understand that they can qualify. They don't understand that actually what happened to them is not normal. And that's called human trafficking. And so um, through the power of social media and different uh, media outlets, I'm able to reach um, several communities to let them know that it's not okay. And even if you don't have papers, you have rights. And those are human rights. That's, you know, the rights of being paid correctly, the rights of having the same, truly the same rights of everybody else. Mm. Just because you don't have paper, you, are, you still are a human being. And so this is how, um, you know, I, this is what I do every day. And I feel extremely honored um, of being able to, you know, serve a lot of, you know, clients nationwide. Immigration is, national, is a federal law. And so more and more people now are aware of it, and it's not okay, you know. So this is uh, how we, what will we do? Wow, that's beautiful. I feel the passion too. It's interesting that you have found a niche that they're not, a lot of people are surprised, right? Yeah. So can you tell us more about the need, what you're seeing yes. and, and what needs to be addressed? Absolutely. Um, so specifically in the context of immigration, we're talking about a type of immigration relief that is called T-Visas. Um, it was introduced in 2000. Unfortunately, it's never been really uh, utilized much. Um, and what this you know, type of um, visa, this type of non-immigrant visa, then also the pathway for a green card allows people uh, that have been victims of human trafficking to then uh, get, you know, get a work permit, get protection, because a lot of our clients, uh, you know, you have to have a clean record to be able to qualify, right? You have to be a good, you know, good moral character person. You have to have all, everything to be able, um, you know, everything right to be able to qualify. And more and more people are able now to gain these. And that means that they can get paid the same amount in a job. That means that because you don't have people, you don't have to work. 15 hours a day, 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, and being paid nothing means that, you know, you can speak up if they don't pay you over time because you actually, you know, deserve that. Um, there are also intimate relationships. And it's not just for women, but it's also for men because many men um, qualify for this. And there is, you know, power control in all, in many of the family dynamics that bring the undocumented person to be subject to this type of trafficking. 
that at the end of the day, that's what it is. You know, it's not just the festival, it's just trafficking. Um, the other thing that I want to bring awareness is when people come through the border, and now, you know, I, I'm not being political by any means, uh, but when people come through the border, they oftentimes come because of other reasons. So they have very difficult situation in their home countries. Um, I've worked with thousands of clients. None of them said, oh, I'm coming because I want to just live in America. It's a beautiful country. They're running from something. Okay, it's really bad, really hard to happen to them. And what is important is to understand that when they come through the border, many things happen to them and the trauma and the real exploitation is something that 20 years later is still in their mind, is engraved in them. And so at least knowing that nothing can repay, there's no justice in this, okay? Like zero justice. There's no way they're gonna do anything. But the only justice they can have is at least knowing that you know, they can sleep at night without the fear that maybe immigration will go to their door and take them away from their children or without the fear that they're going to target and, or, you know, going grocery shopping and they could be picked up and taken away because now they have families here. And so this for me is really a purpose because it's not right. It's not right, you know, and more people need to know that the person that comes to your house or when you go to a restaurant, maybe it's your favorite sushi restaurant, you don't know that the person right there could have been a victim of human trafficking at some point in their life. And so bringing awareness to this is important because we all need to understand. Um, that's why I wrote, I'm writing a book, actually. I had to take a little break because of severe PTSD from secondary trauma, from working so much on the cases. Mm -hmm. I didn't know at the beginning when I started Ooh. working mm -hmm. how bad it was. So while working on the book, it hit me really hard. So I had to take a little bit of a break. Uh, mm -hmm. But with um, my amazing uh, senior attorney that works in my firm, we're writing a book where it's really not about me. There's no ego in any of that. It's not about her. It's about our clients. It's about bringing awareness, sharing their story so you can hear and more people can hear what actually happened. Mm -hmm. It happens with, with um, uh, diplomats. We have many cases of diplomats that bring in people in the United States to work for them with, you know, under fraud, force, coercion, they bring them here. And they are physically like slaves. That's what it is. That's Human trafficking is modern day slavery, and we see that every day. And the undocumented community, they're just so vulnerable because they can be taken, everything they have, everything they work for could be taken any time from them. So that's why it's important for everybody to know and understand that there is another aspect to human trafficking that involves other communities. They're all the undocumented. I personally work a lot with Latinos. Um, I'm also work with other communities, but in the Latino community, this is everywhere, every, everywhere. As we focus on Miami-Dade, we know we have a great privilege of being one of the tip of the iceberg, most international cities. And as we recognize the brilliance that we have as a community, we also have to shine the light on the things that are dark, right? So as you all, because we know who you are there in this audience and the people who are sitting in front of us, you all have incredible networks and none of you go down the rabbit hole of saying the world is a bad place. There's nothing I can do about it because all of you here know that there's something that you can do. So what Julia is asking us all in your call to action is to really focus the light on these stories. So tell us, give us your calls to action. What would you like all of us to know and to do? When, what I really like to everyone to do is look into who's around you, pay attention to what's around and really remember what human decency is because everybody's entitled to that. And oftentimes we don't realize that we have around, immigrants are everywhere. And immigrants, I'm an immigrant myself. At some point I came to this country, I became my country, but I came here as an immigrant. And many of, many of us, that America is based on immigration at the end of the day, right? Um, and what I say is just look at it because there's people there, if something could have happened. And maybe if, if we're looking at it, understanding what's going on could save somebody, could help somebody. And maybe let them know that there's a way for them. Maybe there's no justice. So, you know, usually, you know, I can tell you thousands of cases, it's rare that they're, you know, that actually the law enforcement get involved because of, you know, some are old cases. It's not possible, right? It's understandable. But there is a way that at least something good can come from that, which is 
at least gain legal status in this country and protection because everybody deserves protection. Thank you so much. Have their rights. <laughs> um, our, our, our team will keep on posting. There are numbers that you can call the State Attorney's Office for Human Trafficking, the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And here in Miami-Dade County, we have one of our amazing board members, one of Citrus's speakers today, Yvonne Mesa, who actually initiated the Coordinated Victims Assistance Center. We'll ask the team to post that phone number. If somebody doesn't want to call law enforcement, they can call there. There is support. The only thing that doesn't work is doing nothing. There are brilliant professionals who care in this town. And, um, and we're here to all be connected and to make sure that we make all of these things well known. So thank you so much, Julie. We're gonna ask you to stay here. This is a conversation. Honor. Yeah. It's such an honor <laughs> to be with many powerful women, absolutely. So although we ask each of our panelists usually to introduce themselves, I have to give a special introduction to Dr. Brooke Bellow. Uh, as she mentioned, Dr. McGrath uh, introduced her to the community uh, originally with her amazing work. And then Catherine Fernandez Rundle, our state attorney, introduced Brooke to many of us speaking years ago uh, about the very program that I asked her to speak about today. We're gonna, she's gonna be speaking a, uh, about a lot. She's a, a, a tech uh, cognoscenti leader. She's got awards from Barack Obama and others. And to put her into one definition is quite impossible. So I'm going to ask you to continue to introduce yourself a little bit more, Dr. Brooke Bellow, in context of today's restorative justice conversation. Yeah, well, thank you. Good morning. Um, good morning, everyone. I think that a lot of times uh, in the work, and I want to talk about uh, restorative justice today, I actually helped Maria come up with a how to restore restorative justice because it's something I'm extremely passionate about. A lot of people look at me and assume that I have it all together um, and that everything is okay. But we have to remember uh, part of the aspect of more to life for victims and the violence we work with is victim to survivor, survivor to thriver, and thriver to champion. The work of healing is a long process. And so in order for other survivors from all over the world, in this state, in this nation, around the world, to really understand that you can move past profound trauma if you survive, if you actually six feet above ground, you can't pursue destiny again, you can't pursue identity again, and you can't build dreams again. And so I am passionately doing that um, while passing the baton and assisting others with their discovering their identity and with the legacies for their life. As a survivor of human trafficking, I've always thought that it's a fatherhood issue. I've known that it's a male issue, that the data shows that men are number one, the violers when it comes to exploitation, sex trafficking, over 90%. There's women involved, but most of the time they were victimized previously. It's also important to understand that many uh, violers that we work with, about 30% of men were victims as children. Either they were beaten by their fathers or someone, or they were sexually violated by fathers, uncles, and grandfathers. This is something we have to understand. And I have not worked with a survivor in my team at More to Life where she or he didn't have a heart connection with their very trafficker. And even if they never see that trafficker again, restorative justice does have to take place for true healing to begin. And so if we can just go to the next slide. Um, More to Life has been around for 18 years. Um, we started a really long time ago and we've rescued and worked with over 10,000 victims of human trafficking. When we came to Miami-Dade, uh, it was before the ARGID program. We were working with Glory House and we had a little satellite office in Glory House and in Glory House and when they were next to the little church and we were providing services for victims off the radar. No you know, public announcements, no press releases, nothing like that. And so that's really important. We're also part of the Open Doors Outreach Network, which is in 40 counties in the state of Florida. Um, and so we are really happy. I probably have some of the team on today. We, our offices in Miami are in Wynwood. We've been here for two years and our ARGIT program has been here for five years. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Next slide. Our ARGID program is also akin to another program, which is also court appointed in Miami Day called Live Until You Die, where prostituted persons actually come through our program. And we do uh, begin to really realize that about 40% of them are victims of trafficking. Sometimes when they're taking the program, the trafficker is like right outside the door or sending emails. And so we red flag it, put in the system, and our staff will begin to provide services. 
Um, in one day during the Super Bowl in 2020, 60 uh, victims or positive persons were court appointed to the program in one day. And so we partnered with the advocate program who is the grandfathered uh, desert, ver, the, diversion program um, in Miami-Dade, incredible, the advocate program, and then obviously Cap and Fernandez Rondo. Um, and we provided services to all these victims that were from all over the United States, uh, free of charge, just so that we could get them service in somewhere from Venezuela, from other parts of the nation, other parts of the world. Um, and some of them, I might say, this was the first time they ever decided to be trafficked or to sell themselves uh, because they were encouraged to do so. The Argent program, um, we well, already said that. You can go to the next slide. And so we, Dr. McGrath kind of talked about what restorative justice is. And so you understand it, but, but what we see it as is this, this way that brings empathy and accountability and making amends. Oftentimes in our program, which is often during webinars right now, used to be at the advocate program but during the pandemic, we had to take it virtual. Um, one of our survivors were actually share with a buyer. That buyer uh, is in a demographic here in Miami-Dade, anywhere from 18 to 80 years old. Typically, uh, they're in the 50000 to $200,000 tax bracket. Um, about 65% of them are married. Um, most of them are fathers. And they come into the process thinking that it was all a mistake. Something happened, something went wrong. And then they think there was this other aspect of victimization, meaning this girl wanted to do this and, and I'm helping her because I'm paying her or him or a transgender person and I'm helping them pay their rent, not realizing that that's a victim. And so we've taken over 3000 men through the RJ program uh, and over 700 here in Miami-Dade. And right now today we have 100% no recidivism rate. So anyone that's gone through our program and the 90 day follow-up has not re-crimed. Um, and so that's really important. I think part of it, victims of crime often feel excluded, confused, re-victimized by society and the criminal justice system. I know you realize that Florida has the largest women's prison in the nation and a high percentage of them were victims of trafficking if you do the survey and about 22% are there because of prostitution or related charges. And we know that the data around that is that about 80 to 90% were also exploitation victims or rape victims as children. And so the criminal justice system needs its own type of restorative justice. We can go to the next slide. And so part of the things we do at ARGIT, obviously buyer demand prostitution and the law, the history of prostitution, the health effects mentally, negative social impact, plus everything around sexual violence, uh, the connection of prostitution, buyer demand, and sex, trafficking violence, even domestic violence challenges, survivor testimony, the power of fatherhood and father figures that every man is a father figure, whether he thinks or not. The root causes, the brain, pornography and addiction, porn kills love, what, sex, what healthy sex actually is. There is a lot of uh, the men that come to the program Miami-Dade that have an addiction to pornography. And so there's other services for them after. So the history of it, we break in the myth of playboy, um, healthy relationships, and what is true consent, and then resources and tools to obtain further assistance, we provide that. I actually mentor former federal traffickers in local cases. Um, and I, there is a video that we did, we'll probably share that at a later date, we we're going through this time, but it'd be riveting to hear um, a young man's story who heard his sister being raped by her trafficker in foster care. And he grew up hearing that from three to six when he was on his own at 14 after his father stabbed his mother seven times, he gets indoctrinated into a gang in the Bronx. They taught him how to sell grown women. And so he was indoctrinated by others, eventually moved to Miami-Dade and picked up two federal trafficking charges, um, recently just turned 30 and all he wants to do is change his life. And so there are men out there who have been traffickers who need help and who will not recidivize, who really want to change. And you know the story, former gang member changes his life. It's very similar to that. And so we find that this is extremely important. Also businessmen and fathers who, who just didn't know or who say they didn't know. And we know that, uh, let's go to some data. <laughs> um, next slide. Um, when we look at the data, this is some stuff done by Demand Abolition in Washington, D.C., but there was a huge, huge survey done over a period of two years, and most 
men who buy, uh, when we think about restorative justice, most men who buy, um, 48% of, of prostitute, prostituted persons that are sold only covers 5% of the buyer. So we just work with 5% of buyers, which our program does, just 5% of the nation, we could reduce prostitution and aspects of trafficking because minors are trafficked or prostituted, forced by 48% because they are weekly purchases of what people call commercial sex. And if we can wrap our head around that 5%, we can wrap our head around reducing the number of prostituted victims and buyers in this community and around the nation. Next slide. We can go past this because I'm gonna get through, uh, we have two people that I'm gonna introduce you to today. And I think you're gonna be really excited to hear from these men. Next slide. When we, yeah, right here. So we know that the US uh, has the highest per capita incarceration rate in the world. Why is that an important bullet? Because restorative justice will not take place if, if it's not done within the criminal justice system, with incarcerated institutions, within local jails, because some individuals are being trafficked and violated in prison and the ability for them to get the balance of mental health is really not there today. And I'd like to think about the North Atlantic slave trade starting in, um, in Portugal, a country that I really, really love, in, in 1498, Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese decora, became the first European to sell to Africa, and the first slaves were purchased at that time. When I think about restorative justice, I want to say this, this is absolutely important. When we think about it then and now, we have to understand that modern day slavery is often predicated on the idea when we, because we have not restored justice. Just five years ago, we were saying, calling children prostitutes. Where was their restorative justice? They were repeatedly and still often re-victimized. And so it's important we think of modern day slavery, former slaves or people in this country, whether it's indigenous persons, um, African-Americans, felt that they never really got restorative justice. And we have to tell the truth that 65% of those that are trafficked in the world are girls of color and boys of color, black, Latino, black and brown persons. So it's really important that restorative justice starts with all of us recognizing that racism, bigotry, and the aspects of that push back on restorative justice, and we will not reduce human trafficking if that's our mindset. Uh, next slide. Just quickly, when we think about the Middle Passage, then and now, modern day slavery, the reason I wanted to show this is to show that restorative justice happens because when a victim actually comes out of the bondage that's in their mind, as a survivor, I understand that uh, I turned away from a Hollywood prison actress because of anxiety, PTSD. And even though I might have looked okay around people, I was dying in my skin. I was found dead in my own vomit because I tried to commit suicide. I did not want to live anymore. This is similar to what happened during the transatlantic slave trade. This is the same constraining and profound trauma that victims feel, but we might not notice it because victims don't know, as you said earlier, often that they've been victimized. It has been normalized. Restorative justice is when we express to them, teach them, educate them about the pain, the trauma, and the suffrage that they've gone through so they can come out of that and discover their true identity and begin to thrive. Next slide. And so when we think about comparing then and now, we may not have those that are trafficked on a slave block and a businessman may not be purchasing them in that way, but restorative justice happens when they recognize that modern day slavery is a form of bondage and slavery and the selling of sex, labor trafficking is against the law. And so once upon a time, it was plantation owners and business owners. Now it's a global underground ring. And just as Juliana said, it's diplomats, it's wealthy families, it's labor trafficking, it's domestic servitude. And we have to understand that labor trafficking is also sex trafficking. They're one and the same thing by law. Next slide. And so when we think about restoring the injustice, the slave codes right now, when we think about restoring justice, we think of a victim who is in foster care, going through the Citrus Health Network program. Uh, she's not doing well in school. She's in junior high, high school. Um, she's behind, she's maybe, three grades behind, she's uncomfortable. Restorative justice happens when she's able to hear from you and everyone else that it, number one, it wasn't her fault. She's able to hear from a violator, the violator or a violator 
that what I did was wrong and this should not have happened to you. Restorative justice is this, this aspect when the part of the brain, the hippocampus, the frontal lobes and the heart connect to begin to discover identity to say, I can move past this. Even if no one ever tells me that what I went through was painful, this violator, this trafficker has said that it really wasn't your fault. Restorative justice also happens when that trafficker is forgiven. If we don't forgive violators who are behind bars and who have apologized, shame has a way of repeating evil and trauma and wickedness, which is why individuals who are uh, sex offenders locally hide in plain sight and often recidivize and sometimes want to go back to prison. Um, next slide. And so I wanna um, introduce someone when I talk about restorative justice is for me, um, my father died. I wasn't raised by my dad and he died a few years ago, but I have three brothers. They're all athletes um, and they really take care of me and I have an amazing husband. But I'm gonna talk about Jeff Yanni. Um, he's a former CEO of Authentic ID. We're gonna see him in a second. And we were in Monaco. He created this process where I was able to curate art um, from mostly artists that are local to Florida. Um, launched by uh, the Carlisle Group and uh, Marina Picasso. Um, and it's really, really extraordinary. And what this is doing is giving away for young artists, even those that can't paint that great, an opportunity to make NFTs and prints and express themselves. And we were there in Monaco and in New York, when individuals saw a penny by survivor, they had a whole other idea about what trafficking meant. And so in order to restore justice, we have to find innovative ways to express what's really happened. And a picture is worth a thousand words. A painting is different because it expresses someone's soul. And so that's me there with Marina Picasso. And that's the book in the Picasso Villa there in Monaco. But with that, I wanna introduce uh, Jeff Yanni so we can stop sharing the screen and bring Jeff on. Um, Jeff has started something called uh, Miami Shield. Um, and he is incredible. And so the projects that we're doing to bring funding, uh, we have survivor grants. Uh, survivors get from $1,000 to $5,000 just from writing a letter to More to Life. Um, and the next one will be all local to Miami. But I want to ask Jeff, as a man who, you know, probably made double six figures at a tech company or more, left the tech company recently just to focus on all, uh, A4H, all for humanity, A4H.org to raise money for anti-traffic organizations and to bring a lot of resources right here in Miami-Dade. And so Jeff, why, what does restorative justice mean to you and why are you so passionate about this issue? Well, I think first, um, I am a father and I think I have a young daughter and I've been able to see interactions as, that have happened with her. And it, it, you know, I just realized that this, this isn't an issue, this is an issue that's close to every family. You know, this isn't an issue that's just far off. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, people in my peers that are in the tech world or the business world, they think, you know, this is happening in Thailand and it's not, you know, it's, it's happening right here in their neighborhood. Um, Kai will be able to make that even more personal. Um, so I think, I think one of the things I've learned, I've only been kind of on this journey to, to figure out how I can help over the last year. So this is relatively new, I'm still learning. I don't have the background or the expertise that all of you guys have, but what I do represent is I, I am a man, uh, and I I've learned from Brooke that this is this is largely kind of viewed as a woman's issue, but it's really more of a man's issue, and I think that that's something to have more of people like me that are able to stand up and and kind of interact with the peers that I interact with. So I interact with tech leaders and business leaders in my, you know, my professional career. And so I can be a different voice. You know, I find as I'm talking to these guys, these are guys that have tremendous influence. And you know what, most of the times they're fathers, but they haven't made the connection of what their responsibility is towards this issue. And, and I think once you personalize it and say, hey, what if this was your daughter? You know, what if this was your wife? What if this was your sister? You know, would this be okay? I think something else I learned from Brooke, from you was, that um, we, we had a chance to, where I'm also in the film business. That's a newer part of my career now of, of how to create, um, you know, a, a tier um, films that inspire. And we're trying to, to, to marry those films to 
charitable endeavors. Um, so one day there'll be a film about Brooke and we'll be able to connect it to More to Life as an example. Um, but we were screening a movie at the San Diego Film Festival recently, Brooke was there, and somebody asked, you know, is this a poverty issue? Is this why, you know, this issue happens? And her response was really profound to me. And, and she said, no, this is actually a poverty of the heart issue. And so that's really powerful. So when I come back and think about it from a men's perspective, that's really what's going on here. It's a poverty of the heart issue that men are, you know, that there, there's just an apathy layer that we have to break through to get people to be more empathetic and more involved. Do you think that um, restorative justice, we think about men that are former violators, former buyers of commercial sex, for lack of a better term, I hate that term, um, but do you think that restorative justice with violators, perpetrators, is a positive thing, and if you do, why? Um, I think it's a positive thing because I think, you know, we're all, we all fall short, and I think everybody needs a second chance, but we, but there has to be that restorative process. Um, and so I think it's really courageous for somebody like you, Brooke, who, who, who is able to address that side, you know, as being a survivor yourself and that you have such a passion to really reform the violators is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of inspiring. That, that I think also connects to empathy. So empathy is just thinking about, you know, how, how do we think about people in a different way? But, I, I, you know, I think it's important. I think all the things you were outlining on both sides are, are really, really important. My last question, um, and I admire you so much, because women um, and even men, especially younger boys and transgender persons, sometimes there's a, a profound sense of, of being over-sexualized. I say, you know, a uh, hypersexualized culture kind of per sometimes perpetuates the issues of trafficking. Do you find in your circle um, that men, um, when they hear about trafficking for the first time with a young girl, realize that she was a victim, is there a new revelation in their hearts or in their minds when they realize that some of their behavior might perpetuate it? Yeah, I think so. I think men are, and particularly professional men, they're, they're just literally clueless that that these, you know, if they're engaging in sexual activities like that, that, that those are victims, you know, that those are trafficking victims that they're engaging with. I don't, I don't think there's that connection. And so I, I think for sure that that's there. I think it's interesting looking at the Gen Z as well. One of the things, so the organ, the initiative that we started is called All for Humanity Alliance that the Brooks organization More to Life is, is, is part of. And it was really about how do we innovatively look at this? What are all the different things we can do? One of the things we did this year was a, a national college scholarship. And the prompt was for college students, Gen Z, to think about this issue and, and why this issue was important and why it needed to be addressed and what they thought about it. And we got, and we made it a pretty significant scholarship. It was a $25,000 scholarship because we really wanted to rise to the top. So because having a college a child that just went to college and you ask them to do scholarships, the ones they pay attention to are the, are the big ones. You know, it's hard to get them to do the $500 ones. But the, um, so we got thousands and thousands of responses. But I think what came through with that is that Gen Z wasn't aware of this issue. It started to kind of get them to think about it differently. And how do they think more em empathetically? Because this is a generation that's, that's, uh, has a crisis of apathy from my perspective. Uh, that they're that they're trying to deal with, uh, but they also, as they got connected to it, as Gen Z and the generation of purpose, also said something else that was profound, and that was that they think they're the generation that can solve this. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So, um, so it's interesting that we have to look at this and all. You know, it's not just men my age, but it's also what happens when you get high school kids thinking about this and talking about this. That all of a sudden they start looking at it differently. And they start, you know, I've seen that happen with my daughter as we've gotten that conversation going with her and her male friends, how all of a sudden they start thinking about it differently. How do we get them to think about women and their relationships, male and female, in a more mm -hmm. empathetic 
positive way. That that hopefully is part of that process of, of kind of you know changing the demand curve. Yeah. Thank you. That was awesome, Jeff Yanni. Thank you so much. And so I want to introduce right now um, one of my board members and friends, um, Kai Zen Bickle. His father, Peter Nygaard, Kai walked away from $100 million to turn his father in. Nygaard was first taken into custody in Winnipeg in December 2020. This is because of his son, who you're about to meet. In October 2021, he agreed to be extradited to the United States, where he faces charges of trafficking and racketeering. Um, part of the issue is a lot of the trafficking that happens in the Bahamas, there was not a reciprocity. So he was able to get by on, on those things. But Kai actually has a bill um, that you can support uh, that's connected to Child USA to support uh, reciprocity with all of these other principalities and countries. So, hey, Kai. Hey, hello, everyone. We want to applaud you first. Uh, Thank you. Well, I want you to kind of just share a little bit about you. And the first question is going to really talk about restorative justice. And you had to do the hard thing. You had to walk away from a legacy, a heritage, to do a different kind of legacy. And that's the destiny of honor and truth and justiceness. And that is a rare, rare thing. So I just want you to share a little bit, a little bit about you and then talk about how is that restored justice to the victims within your own family and yourself. Sure. Well, thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to have a couple moments here to speak about this. Um, briefly about me, I was really lucky because I grew up with my mother. I had a tremendous um, male father figure type out in the uh, Pacific Northwest where I grew up named Billy Frank Jr., who's an icon for humanitarian efforts out here. And I, I was blessed to have um, positive influences and a wholesome upbringing. Um, my father was a uh, uh, business tycoon uh, in Bahamas and Canada. He made his residency in the Bahamas. Um, at first, we thought it was for uh, some kind of tax strategy, but it turns out through this uh, whole situation that unfolded that he was also using it because he was able to avoid criminal prosecution from the USA whenever he would bring in a US citizen to the Bahamas, if they were abused there and they came back home to the USA, no matter what their evidence was, it was out of the US jurisdiction. Just that quick 30 minute flight basically left it in the Bahamian authorities' hands. And the trouble was, was that he um, had them paid off in his pocket. So um, I, I, the first question that comes up uh, with this whole situation is, well, how did you not know what, what was going on? Um, and the answer to that is that there are 13 co-conspirators that were listed after the investigation as people who knew or should have known that something was nefarious was going on. Uh, my relationship with him uh, started mostly in, ter uh, in terms of me spending more time with him. Uh, when I was 21, I tried working in the family business, lasted about three years before I decided I wanted to not work directly under him or answer to him. Um, he's someone that is a very abusive, uh, narcissistic type of personality. And I was um, just trying to come at it with a very open heart and love my father and be there for him. So I branched off within the company to expand uh, family businesses in the sort of social entrepreneurship realm. And it was really more of like a long distance relationship where I would see him, he was very, particular about what he showed people. So uh, I, the, the, the Peter Nygaard I knew was someone who would make speeches about how important it is to respect women, um, how he was anti-drug, all this kind of thing. I would see him for volleyball and occasional dinner parties. Everything changed for me in 2019. I attended a dinner party and I witnessed him um, basically touching a, uh, a eight or nine year old uh, inappropriately when he thought everybody uh, wasn't looking. This was one of his girlfriend's um, children. And, uh, and he had multiple girlfriends and, and whatnot, but he was always talking about how honest and upfront he was about everything. And, and uh, I blew the whistle internally about it. Um, another note is that through the 15 years where I was sort of 
building businesses. Uh, my name was continuing to go on many of the assets and he referred to it as quote, golden handcuffs, meaning that I'd have access to those ac assets as long as I was in good favor with him. And uh, when it was time to pass, if he was gonna pass them on, they would come to me. So sort of like always working for equity, but I wasn't really empowered with a lot of money. And uh, after I blew the whistle, um, I started to get attacked uh, internally. I blew the whistle to his HR department and, and that was just a huge problem because he, uh, they are also listed as an enabler for him. And then six short months later, he was hit with a civil suit, which went all over the media. 10 people came forward from the Bahamas, which then um, through a series of events and evidence that I gathered, I reached out to the civil attorneys wanting to know more. I found out the civil suit had gone from 10 to 57 in the period of seven short weeks. Um, I asked to be connected to the FBI and, um, and that he was a massive flight risk. And I started working with them, um, basically receiving an ultimatum along the way from my father that if I didn't support him and uh, do as he said, that I would lose everything that I had worked for the last 15 years. And um, for me, you can make more money, but you can't replace lost innocence. And I couldn't live with the thought of another child or person um, being abused by him if he was to get away. Um, so I went all in all my efforts on the uh, pursuit of justice. And uh, just to end or summarize this and bring it to an end, it was a agonizing 10 month process where I thought he was gonna flee the country at any moment. Mm -hmm. um, there was nothing that really could be done to stop him from fleeing the country, even though we, there were massive amounts of people coming forward. And Hi. I, yeah. Let me I, I just got a note that they're going to interrupt you in two minutes. So I, oh. I could listen to this all day. So I want to, what, first of all, I think everyone is, is you're, you're, you're the epitome of restoring justice. What you've done is what restorative justice is all about. What your father didn't do, won't do, can't do, you've done. Um, if someone could just give two minutes past uh, that 59 mark, I want you to talk about the legislative bill really quick. Yeah. and how this really uh so let me support you both in saying that we know that many of you have to go on to something else to attend we're going to do the extraordinary our team will continue to record this and so uh, if anybody has to log off or anybody has to go over for the breakfast uh, these remaining extra say 10 minutes that we're going to have with dr bello and her and our guests Hi. um, um will, will be recorded so take away brooke um so kai Go ahead and share, finish your thought about your your bio father, and then go ahead and talk about the legislative bill, which is born out of what happened, what your father did. Sure. And just uh, I'll try to wrap this in 30 to 45 seconds if I can. Um, the quick summary of this whole process was that it became clear that he was taking advantage of loopholes within the legal system. One of them was this jurisdiction loophole where just a quick 30 minute flight basically absolved him of criminal prosecution. The other one was that he used the threat of um, a defamation lawsuit if anyone was to speak up. And so that was uh, keeping people silent. And so that those were his two primary mechanisms for essentially hiding his behavior over the course of what turned out to be over five decades. And um, just to put this in context, the Epstein uh, civil suit, I believe, was around 60 folks, and uh, his civil suit is well over 120. So that's double. And uh, he eventually was arrested, but only four or five people actually qualified to file criminal charges against him in the USA. So that's what this bill is all about, is that if you do go to a foreign country and you are able to bring, bring evidence back to the USA, that the USA can use it and protect its citizens um, in a court of law. And I think the other area of restorative justice that will empower survivors is giving them tools to be able to report these things safely and effectively. That can be done through um, uh, even our cell phone now, and there are different apps and ways that we can do that. But I think technology is going to be a, a massive advantage. Last point I just want to make in terms of identity, um, it's a pretty rough 
transition, I think. Uh, I used to be the uh, son of this uh, well-respected kind of billionaire. And within a matter of, of moments, really, in the media, I all of a sudden became son of the pedophile, rapist, horrible person. That's kind of rough. Um, but I think that from this whole experience, and by the way, when I did blow the whistle to my family, I lost 90% of my Nygaard family. Um, luckily, I'm with my mom in the Bickle side, and I'm able to, to, to stay with that. But uh, yeah, it's been a journey. And I hope that the pain and the, uh, the problems from all of it, if we can just take this advantage and create lasting change, particularly in legislation, then we're actually will have a form of restorative justice. And that's what I'm dedicated to do. So in closing, um, I just want to thank Maria for being actually on the leadership council of More to Life. More to Life is in this community. We don't do a lot of press releases, but we are here working really, really hard. We have a bunch of uh, stuff that we're doing that we think is really supportive, and we believe in this. So um, you can always connect with uh, me. Um, my email in the chat, someone can say Brooke, B-R-O-O-K at M-O-R-E-T-O-O life.org. Um, if you want to have more information from Kai, if you want to know more about the local programs, RJED and LUID, we also offer those programs for uh, in for like communities and halfway houses that can't pay for it. They can log on and use some of the programs uh, free of charge as an offering as a part of their program, and they're pretty informative. And with that, I just want to thank you all for for being with us today. So it sounds like an ending. We all know. I know you, and I know you. This is the beginning. We have the luxury of having these brilliant minds telling us what we need to know and what we can do. You've heard from people today, the only way that we can do our collective work is by listening to the leader and taking our piece and saying, I know I can do something about that. If you have any doubts, you have Camila and this team, that can connect you here to More to Life, to uh, Attorney Fantachi Services, and others and to one another. So let's say stronger together, the work starts here and starts today. And I have a personal, I told Dr. Bello, who now I'm honored to call Brooke, that the program that she's doing with the state attorney and others of restorative justice, that's one of the many things that we need to make famous. So that's my call to action to you all today. Let, let's, let's have real people understand what real life is so we can start this process and then end up with forgiveness. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you all. And uh, for you Impact Collaborative people, we have NPR Stacy Bannock Smith supporting us uh, one month from today and with our economic mobility scholars. So coffee. incredible. Um, See you next month. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I want to give it to you. They're, they don't. They, they, yeah, we only made 200 and they were all gone. Thank so you both. Are you sure? I'm sure. I want you to have it. You've been fantastic. You deserve it. I pulled out a page by mistake, so. Better. I think of you. Yeah, but we have more coming. Yeah. Look at that. Thank you, ladies. Uh, Maria. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, team. Bye, Kai. Bye, You're been amazing. Jeff. Bye, Jeff. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much.